Good morning. Welcome to the April 24th, 2020 Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting. Um, uh, first of all, I want to um, let you know the meeting's being recorded. And I want to begin by having, uh, have, having you know, our board secretary, Gina Pye, please call the roll. Gina, we can't hear you. Not very well. Okay. Now we can hear you. Okay. Director Bontorf? I have to unmute them individually, so. Oh, we can unmute ourselves. Okay. Just raise your hand. Yeah. If you can unmute individually, that would be best. We'll get the hand raised. Okay, Director Bottorf. I saw him earlier. He, he can't unmute himself if, if the master mute him. Yes, off. he can. I just did it. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, well, I see Director Bottorf is there. Director Bottorf? He's unmuted. Okay, uh, I'm unmuted and I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Director Kaufman Gomez? Present. Director Gonzalez? Present. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lind. No. Director Matthews. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. Here. Thank you. Director Pegler. I'm here. Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rotkin. Here. Expicio Director Henderson. Here. Ex officio, Director Northcutt. We have quorum. Directors Lynn Thank you. and ex officio, Director Northcutt are absent. Thank you for that. We're now going to confirm the staff that are online. Um, and if the staff could respond with uh, that they're here as well, that would be good. Alec Clipper. Andrew Payton. Julie Sherman. And then we're going to have Alex, the, uh, the, you can tell us the rest of the folks we're expecting on the call if you would for the John public. Ergo is here. There's John Ergo. And Gina Pye. Great. I haven't um, seen Sarah. Okay, before we, I'm going to read something here. Before we move on to the first order of business, I want to thank everyone for being flexible about joining this meeting by phone or uh, computer this morning. We're trying a new way of conducting our business and appreciate your patience as we move from item to item. We may stumble around a bit here, but we'll get to it. In order to present their item, I'll be asking board members if they have any comments or questions. And if there are questions, we'll call on each, uh, we will call on each individual board member. After the discussion portion, we'll ask for if there are any public comments before taking the, pro um, we're gonna vote by taking roll call votes, by the way, not simply taking eyes and nays because we have no other way to know how, how we're doing. Um, if you're not speaking, please mute your phone and we may do that for you. We'll see how, how that's gonna work. Um, and we're gonna move on now to agenda item number three, which is we're gonna recess our general meeting to a committee that's made up of some of the members of our board. This is a body that exists um, in case we ever need to uh, float a bond or do some kind of financial action that the board is not allowed legally to do directly. But we have a group that basically acts on our behalf that's made up of a rotating group of, of board members. And so we're gonna turn this meeting, we're gonna recess our general meeting and turn this over to the um, Santa Cruz Civic Improvement Corporation meeting. And Ed uh, Bottorf is going to run that meeting. And Mr. Chair, just for the record, I would point out that Donna Lind has joined. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call to order the uh, Santa Cruz Improvement Corporation meeting. And can we uh, begin with a roll call, please? Director Bottorf. Here. Director Leopold. Director McPherson. 
Here. Director Gonzalez. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Present. We have quorum. Thank you. First order of business is a consideration of an appointing Director Kaufman Gomez to serve as the SCCIC board officer. Uh, is there a motion to take that action? I move approval. This is John Leopold. I'll second it. Second was Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we have a uh, roll call vote on that item? Roll call vote. Director Botorf? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. And Director Gonzalez? Aye. Motion is passed. Thank you. Uh, at this time, do we have any oral or written communications to the board? No. We have none. Thank you. Are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? No. Okay, at this time, I'd like to uh, go to item approve of the prior year minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the prior, prior year minutes? I move approval of the prior year minutes. John Leopold. Second. Thank you. Do I have a second? I probably. I'll second. Bruce I, probably Green, I, believe that's, I believe that's Kaufman Gomez with a second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, can I have a roll call vote on that item? Yes. Director Botorf. Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Trina, uh, Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. Motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. Our next item is the acceptance of financial statements for fiscal year 2019. And do I have a uh, presentation from Angela or, uh, on this? No, sir. Just the, the statement okay. that's in the... Uh, we just have the statements. So at this point, I'll entertain a motion to entertain the financial statements. Also move. That motion is to accept it. Also that move. motion is to accept the financial statements of 2019. Also move. Second. McPherson second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any comment from the public on this item? No. Seeing none, we'll move on to a roll call vote. Can we please have a roll call vote? Director Botorf? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. May I just confirm that the motion was Director Kaufman Gomez and the second was Director McPherson? Correct. Correct. Thank you. Motion is passed. Uh, thank you all for your patience and we'll adjourn this meeting and return back to the regularly scheduled Board of Directors meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, Just a moment. All right, next. Um, let me ask if this is an opportunity for, uh, we were reconvening the meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District for April 24th, 2020. Uh, we're now gonna ask if there are any members of the public that would like to make general comments about transit issues that are uh, not on our, this morning's agenda. Do we have a way of knowing uh, who is online from the public? We've got 41 participants. Can you see? Gina? Um, Let me see if I've got anybody here. Okay, we're just kind of trying to sort this out because it says there's 41 participants. But there are no hands raised, no comments, no chats. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll close oral communication. We'll ask if any of the labor organizations have comments for this morning that are on items not on our agenda. One question from James Chan uh, Sandoval. James, please speak up. He's muted. Okay, there it goes. Unmuted. James, you're free to go. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 
All right. Sorry. It's all new to me. So <laughs> good to see all of you guys. This is uh, rather interesting. So um, first, I want to start off by uh, saying, you know, our drivers, um, I just want to give recognition to our drivers, you know, with the, the challenges that they're facing right now, you know, risking their lives and their family lives by coming to work. You know, they're dedicated to their job. They're dedicated to this community. And I hope them showing up to work every day speaks to their level of commitment. Um, I also want to give recognition to Alex, Ciro, Anna, uh, the rest of Metro's management's team. Uh, they have stepped up. I know you all received an email from me early on, and um, I do want to clear that up. Things have gotten a lot better since. Um, the communications there, the dialogues there, we're working together. Um, our drivers feel safe. I mean, as safe as they can feel. Uh, we got a lot of things like the driver area partitions, masks, gloves, you name it. And um, everyone appreciates it. And I just really hope we continue to work together because that's what it's going to take to get through this. Um, I do also want to mention too that we had a former driver here that retired just four years ago that passed away from the coronavirus. Um, we can't say if he got it while working, but he was driving up at UCSC when this happened. And, uh, and it, and it, instill a lot of fear with our drivers. Despite their fear, they're still continuing to come show up because they're committed to moving this public for the essential workers. Um, I also want to speak to the, the new legislation with the CARES Act with the money. I know there's flexibility to use it. Um, I'm just hoping that the intention of that is to help maintain staff. Um, I know we're bleeding money as a transit agency and the future is really shaky for us. Um, I just hope that the least we can do for these drivers or anyone here staffed at Metro is to try to maintain them as long as possible so we continue to get a paycheck to feed our families. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, James. Anyone else from the labor organizations? No one else. Seeing, seeing none, I passed over this, but are there any board members that have general comments they'd like to make to us this morning on items not on our agenda? None. I don't see anyone raising a hand. Okay. Um, have, do we have any written communications from the MAC this morning, the Metro Advisory Committee? No, sir. Okay, that brings us to our consent agenda. This is an item on which uh, we put a number of items together and take a single action on all of them. These are generally considered to be items that are likely to be not controversial, but it's possible for board members to pull those items off the agenda and discuss them if there are questions or concerns that we would like to address. Members of the public will have an opportunity right now to let us know if there's any item on that consent agenda they would like the board to discuss further. So I'm going to wait just a moment here to see if we have anyone from the public that I like or the unions who would like to comment on consent agenda items. I don't see any hands. I don't see any as well. Thank you very much. So now we are back to the consent agenda. Let me ask board members if there are any I would like to pull from the consent agenda for further discussion. I don't see any. All right, I uh, walk a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Is that Donald Lind? Yes. John Leopold seconds. I, um, Cynthia, I have a quick question on, uh, I think it's 10-4. Speak a little louder, Cynthia. Okay. Um, I have a question on 10-4, which is the uh, revised capital budget. And um, it does uh, mention earlier that the uh, Paracruz grant is not going through. So the question is, how does that um, affect our capital budget? And then obviously the capital budget in the past um, from the original one increased by about, well, over $10 million. So, um, and we're in such a new world. <laughs> I guess that's the point. Subject to major revision. Can, do we simply acknowledge that here? Yeah, so uh, two questions there. I'll go after the first one, which is the Paracruise. Um, you might recall that we were not able to get 
a uh, basically a shovel ready package <clears throat> in time for the current year's cycle of uh, bus and bus facility grant. Yeah. So we're working, we're still expending dollars over the next year preparing for a shovel ready project that we'll submit for the bus and bus facilities grant next year. So still on our list, uh, still hopeful to happen, um, but that's where we're at with that one. And then I'll let Angela answer the question. I'm not familiar with where you're referring to about. No, well, just from the, we've, we've had several revisions of the capital budget and it went from 20,000 to 30 a million to 33 million. Right, so it's a combination of we received more grants than we had back in June. And then we've also added our local match to those grants. Um, if you look at um, the detail portion, 10-4-C-1, if you go to 10 4 c one you'll see where we showed you the type of money we've added and which um, which capital project that that money went to. And we, we've uh, done that on a consistent basis because obviously back in June, we didn't know exactly what we were going to be doing and what kind of money is coming in. And we never put forward anything uh, that we don't have the money in the bank. So those adjustments, uh, we've gotten around um, $10 million between the grants and the local match that we've had to put forward. Um, yes, you are correct. We are um, looking at the projects that uh, we're going to be going forward with because it is grant money versus operating money and the ones that we could delay um, to future depending on what's going on. Yeah. And then uh, this is for Alex too, back on the Paracruz. Um, my recollection is that we had an ultimatum on the lease. Is that being extended or yeah, it, is the urgency factor still there? Well, the it's, it's still there. It expires next year. Uh -huh. it, you know, our assumption is that, that he may not renew or, or, you know, obviously we still would like to control our own destiny. Um, but no matter what, it would take an extension in order to stay there. Um, what we don't know is what the impact of the current COVID crisis and the economic recovery will be on all of that as, yeah. as we get closer to the exit. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on the consent agenda in terms of comments before we take our vote? Okay, nothing got pulled. We had some comments and questions. Now, we'd like, uh, we have a motion to approve, I believe. Am I right? Motion to approve the consent agenda. This is Bruce. I think you have a motion, Lynn, second Leopold on the table. It's already there, Bruce. I think we have a motion. Oh, excuse me. So, do we now take a roll call vote on that motion to approve the consent agenda? Director Bosworth? Aye. It's hard to hear you, Gina. Director Conklin, Gina, it's very hard to hear you. She's going to turn her mic on. Her mic's not on. Mic Hi. Gina, we can't hear you. Your mic's not on. Director Baltar? Now we hear you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Ed, for the third time. Director Kaufman <laughs> Gomez? <laughs> Trina, your, your mic's not on either. Yes. Alex, uh, or somebody clear all the mics for the roll call. Just clear them all. Director Gonzalez. Uh, aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director Matthews. Is that me? Matthews. Yes. Yeah. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. Director Rotkin. Aye. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, our next item, um, I'm sure I got this right. Um, I believe we are on item number 11 now, am I correct? Correct. Yeah. This is the presentation of employee longevity awards. It's unfortunate under these conditions, we're not gonna have someone present in the room to receive our gratitude for their long time service to this district. I'm going to read something. Um, and um, can I have Ryan's full name? I don't have that in front of me. Ryan McDonald. Thank you. Ryan was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California. He holds a special place in his heart for the natural beauty and wonder of Santa Cruz. 
With 15 years invested in the parts department for Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District, Brian believes in the local community and wants to see it thrive. He works hard to ensure that local citizens have affordable and dependable public transportation. As a teenager and young adult, Ryan himself utilized the public transportation system in Santa Cruz and saw it as a wonderful asset to gain independence. He brings him joy to offer this service to new generations and to provide safe and dependable rides to all. Starting out as a parts and materials clerk, Ryan put in over a decade of service to become the lead. Over the years, he took managerial classes for supervisors and Metro-sponsored career ladder trainings to further his position. In early January of this year, Ryan took on the interim supervisory role of the parts department and is currently enjoying this new challenge. Let me ask if there are any director comments at this point. Are there any public comments at this point? Thank you. Um, I want to thank Ryan years of service and obviously this district is the people that work here and do the actual service for the public and we appreciate Ryan's long-term contribution to this district and to this community. Um, we're now on item number um, do we have you know, okay, number uh, 12 which is the introduction to graduating class and CEO Clifford will introduce Anna Marie Govea who will introduce the class. Okay. And uh, with that, Anna Marie, are you on the line? Okay. Should we see pictures of our new class of operators, like uh, people, service workers, and mechanics? Okay. Okay, we're we're missing management or having a hard time getting online. But you have before you, or you had before you, the pictures of our. Um, graduating class of bus operators. I believe we have one VSW in there, which is a person who services our buses and then also a mechanic in that group. Um, so we would welcome them aboard. And I know they would have liked the opportunity to be here in person as they normally would be. Are there any comments from uh, board members about the new class? Any comments from the public about the new class of employees? Seeing none, next we're going to have the introduction of John Ergo, Metro's new Planning and Development Director, and I, Alex Clifford will make this presentation. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Directors. I'll just read a, a brief bio about John and then ask John if he would like to make a couple of comments. But I'd like you to join me in welcoming John as our new Planning and Development Director. He replaces uh, Barrow Emerson, who uh, are some tough shoes to fill, as you all know. Over the past two years, John has taken on progressively responsible roles as a transportation planner and project manager at multiple levels of government in the San Francisco Bay Area. Immediately prior to joining Metro, John spent seven years with AC Transit, where he helped lead planning and outreach for the agency's Measure BB service expansion plan and served as a project manager on key initiatives, including Dumbarton Express Corridor Improvements, the publication of design guidelines for managing bus and bike roadway interactions, and the development of a mobile fare payment pilot. John is also known for launching AC Transit's Flex service in 2016, one of the uh, first agency operated micro transit projects in the country. John has uh, master's degrees in city planning and transportation engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in environmental analysis from Pomona College. Prior to his transportation career, John worked as a community organizer on environmental campaigns in Philadelphia, Nebraska, and Utah. Originally from New York, John has been visiting his aunt, uncle, and cousins in Santa Cruz for 35 years and is excited to return with his wife, Mariana, and six-month-old son, Luca. With that, I'd like to ask John if he'd like to say a couple of words, Mr. Chair, with your permission, of course. Yes, please go ahead, John. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning, board chair, members, staff, and public. I'm excited to be here. These certainly weren't the circumstances under which I expected to arrive at Santa Cruz Metro, uh, but I knew from my background research that this organization is very well managed and I learned quickly upon my arrival that 
even though Barrow left uh, a very big role to fill, my, my team here is exceptional and have been firing on all cylinders. Um, when I joined AC Transit, the organization was still reeling from the effects of the Great Recession. And within two or three years, we had worked to pass a, a countywide measure that funded the first service expansion in over a decade. And I learned that whether in upswings or downturns, uh, this job is always about making the most uh, very limited resources in order to provide the best possible service to our customers and to the community at large. There's opportunity in every crisis, uh, to paraphrase the Winston Churchill adage, and I, I really look forward to working with all of you uh, to do everything I can to help Metro weather this current storm and, and come out stronger on the other end. So thank you, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, John. On behalf of the board, welcome to the district, and we're looking forward to working with you closely, and hopefully at some point, maybe actually in person. <laughs> Are there any comments from board members about this uh, decision, hiring decision? Um, <laughs> yes, please, Cynthia. No, just welcome. I'm just, again, so eager to meet in person. <laughs> Feel part sort of it. Anything else from the board? Uh, any member of the public have a comment about this item? I don't see any hands. Good. So moving on, welcome um, again. Excuse and, me, um, thank you. Chair Rotkin? Yes. Um, Ex officio Director Northcutt has joined the meeting. Welcome, glad to see you. Actually, I see your name. I guess you're here by phone. Um, there she is. Next, we're moving to item 14. This is the CEO's report. Alex, you're on. Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you, directors. Uh, just briefly on the new employees part, uh, we have, we've had a temp here for a while helping us out and uh, he came up against his uh, maximum hours as a temp. So we've, during this crisis period, we need a little bit of extra assistance in our IT department. And he's learned so much while he's been here as a temp. So Mariano Bernal uh, has been brought on board as a provisional employee. Uh, he will be with us anywhere from six months to a maximum of two years in that role. Uh, we have Cristobal Rivera Vasquez, facilities maintenance manage, uh, maintenance worker two, um, promotion. And Juan Serrano is a promotion to paratransit supervisor. And then, of course, you, you just met John. Um, continuing on under the CEO report, I'm uh, happy in some respects to report that two of the three uh, free fair legislations have moved to next year's agenda. So they haven't gone away permanently, but they're still uh, out there, but moved to next year's. The one, which is the college, free college pass, AB 2176 Holden, um, has not moved to next year, and he's still trying to move forward. Um, we still have a lot of concerns with that, even though he has made some concessions in the language, but at the end of the day, the way it is written, um, in which it, it sort of includes those who have existing programs, uh, it doesn't protect us enough because right after the legislation were to be adopted, if it were adopted, you could have both the uh, Cabrillo College and UCSD students put forward vote to remove their program so that they can take advantage of a free program. So it, it's still not written well to alleviate the concerns that we have and we'll continue to try to. Um, not sure if it'll continue too far into the process uh, because the chair of the, the assembly and the Senate are trying to narrow the kinds of things that they'll deal with this year, probably predominantly, if not entirely COVID related. And that one is not. Um, also given the uncertainty of the future right now, we've taken a page out of our 2014, 2015 timeframe, which we had the fiscal crisis, the fiscal cliff, and we reinitiated weekly leadership meetings to begin the process of trying to sort out what this uh, impending fiscal crisis looks like and to try to get a jump on it uh, so that you don't, you're not faced with what you were faced with back in 2014 and 15. Um, you, as was mentioned earlier, the CARES Act does appear to provide this agency about $20 million in 5307 and 5311, um, but we should not think of that as a panacea. We should think of it at best case 
as a bridge. Uh, and it's and the length of that bridge we don't know at this time due to a number of factors. Um, it's too early to determine what we must do uh, in order to ultimately keep our expense in line with our revenues. Um, what we call our economy-based revenues, which are typically sales tax dollar-based, um, and also state revenues, which are TDA, which are sales tax and fuel tax. Uh, we won't know, they, they lag uh, at least two months and we may not have a clear understanding of what's going on right now in the way of sales tax until August or September of this year. And obviously that makes it very difficult to try to put a mitigation plan in place with all of that uncertainty. Um, just as an example, if we lose 50% of our economy-based revenues, and the, concentrating just on the TDA and the sales tax, that would be about a $20 million a year loss right there alone. Um, we don't know when fares will return to normal. Um, that is the collection of fares. We hope that that will happen um, as soon as we, we get past the shelter in place and the social distancing, uh, but we don't know uh, when that will end. And then we also don't know when UCSC and Cabrillo will return to in-person classes uh, and what that will look like for the level of service that they're willing to, to purchase. Uh, and then this week, we also found out that the city is uh, uh, wanting to renegotiate the contract that they have with us that doesn't expire uh, for a considerable amount of time on the EcoPass. Um, that could have a revenue impact on us also. So we're, you know, bottom line, if you sort of take a page out of Angela's previous slide that she's shown you before of a a brick foundation, you know, we're standing on a brick foundation, but, you know, day by day, those bricks are sort of being ripped out from underneath us and it's becoming more and more unstable. Um, all of that, again, to emphasize one more time, makes it that much more difficult to try to figure out the path forward. Um, and, and so we're trying to navigate that as best as possible and hopeful that the management team will be able to help guide us through this. Mr. Chair, that concludes my CEO updates. Thank you very much, Alex. Are there any comments from uh, board members? Seeing none, are there any comments from members of the public? Okay, then we'll then move on to item number 15. This is uh, <coughs> a, a discussion of the uh, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are several action items that we need to take in response to this. And I'll ask uh, Alex Clifford to please uh, introduce this. Sure, so uh, Mr. Chair, directors, item 15 is divided into three reports. And we'll start off with the first one, which is 15A. Uh, Angela Aiken, our uh, CFO, will present that item and then I'll come back to present 15 B and C. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. <clears throat> so usually when we do a declaration of fiscal emergency, we kind of have hard to, to hear you. Sorry? You have to be closer to the mic. It's hard oh. to hear you. All right. Okay. That good? That's perfect. Thank you. Right. So usually when we do fiscal emergency, we usually have some numbers that go with it. This time, as Alex was alluding to, our numbers are changing daily. Um to uh, do the fiscal emergency, we have to declare it through the board. And this time we we're declaring it because of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Uh, mass transit is considered an essential service. And so we've continued to provide the public with the best service that we can at the time with our available resources. Um, but we have, as we've all been talking about, uh, substantially reduced the service that we have provided in the past. So normally when we do a reduction in service, we have to have um, a CEQA, um, environmental impact study done, but because of the statutory uh, exemptions, we do not have to do this that this time because we are declaring a fiscal emergency. Um, just wanna read this here. Fiscal emergency when applied to a public owned transit agency means that the agency is projected to have negative working capital within one year from the date the agency makes the finding. And that's exactly what uh, we've done. All the numbers that uh, my staff have uh, crunched and accumulated has come up with a major negative within a year on our capital income or our, our income at all. As uh, Alex kind of alluded to, if you do a quick number of our uh, information today, just to throw out some numbers as of right this minute, 
Uh, we have about $40 million that comes in every year from passenger revenues, and that's from Highway 17 as well as local fares. And um, in eight months of normal revenues, we were doing fine. But in the, if we lose that, because now we're doing three fares for the last four months, that's a million three just in those four months. Then you go to the sales tax piece. The sales tax piece is 68% of our revenue. That's about $39 million. Um, again, the first uh, six months were okay, but we already saw sales tax um, sales tax for January. The receipts for sales tax in January were down by $200,000 before this all started. We just got February's numbers yesterday and it was down $400,000 again before all of this happened. And that's a 20 odd percent reduction in our sales tax related revenues already. So if that continues, the $20 million from the CARES Act, uh, that'll be gone in less than 10 months. So just want to kind of put all that in perspective that uh, we're going to do our best to keep everything going to the, uh, that we can, but uh, we're losing, we're bleeding revenue uh, quite fast. So that's why uh, we need to go back and um, do this fiscal emergency. So I'm asking the board to um, uh, make that finding and move forward. Thank you, Angela. This yeah. is uh, a public hearing and uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on our intention to pass a, 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 a approve a, a declaration of fiscal fiscal emergency. Are there any uh, comments from the public? See none. Gina says see none. See none. Um, the public hearing is now closed, um, and we have a staff uh, recommendation. Uh, you want to present this to us in any more detail than you already have? And that's about the only detail I have right now. I'm sure that's it'll enough. I just tomorrow. wanted to make sure you had a chance to fully explain whatever you wanted to. Um, so the public hearings are adjourned and we are now gonna take action on this item. We'll take them, each of these three items uh, individually as vote. So we'll have a roll. Let me get a motion first. Vote to, to approve. Fiscal, fiscal emergency. Dan Rothwell moves that. And second. Oh, second. I just didn't catch that. Who was that? Second, Donna Myers. Donna Myers, thank you. Um, there was a motion and a second. Um, can we have a roll call, please? I have a motion from Rothwell, a second from Myers. Roll call. Director Bothar? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson. Aye. You get me? Yes. Yeah. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Rothwell? Aye. Director Rotkin? Aye. It's unanimous. So that passed, but uh, Bonnie Moore had a question which I'd be happy to have us try and respond to. Question was how how will this uh, situation we're in now affect our labor agreements? I guess that's a question to Alex to start. Uh, I think the answer is there's nothing that we can say about that particular point. We have a local agreement in place, and and uh, they will continue to be in place. I can't hear you. So the the answer was we don't at this point. There's no intention to uh, do anything other than follow the labor agreements that we have. If at some point that became infeasible or not possible or something, we would we'd obviously have to discuss that in public and have a full discussion. But there are no current plans to do anything to alter any of the existing labor agreements. Chair, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Yes, John. Um, uh, it's 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 always difficult to take these kind of votes uh, in recognition of the difficult financial situation that we're in. Uh, I, as someone who's been on the board for a while, and having gone through a couple of near-death experiences with Metro, I know that what, what works best is us all working together, working with our employees and working with the public to, to protect the, our critical services and figure out ways that we can save some money so we look for the long-term um, viability of the agency. And I'm confident with the leadership that we have both in our management and in our respective unions that we can pull together uh, with this board uh, to come up with a plan to get us through these difficult times that we that that we none of us have great experience on, uh, but I'm confident, given what we've already been through, that that we can do this again. Thanks, John. 
And for those of you that didn't see it, Bonnie Moore responded, thanking the board for our uh, uh, work here. And thank John specifically for his comments, I think. Um, we are now moving on to item number 15B. This is a request for board ratification of actions taken to address the COVID-19 crisis. And I'll turn that back over to Alex again to start. Thank you, Mr. Chair, directors. And um, Mr. Chair, with your permission, uh, I'm gonna go into a great amount of detail. It might be a little bit of a lengthy report, but I think there probably is no more important issue right now than what we've been faced with during this COVID crisis. That'd be okay. I'll cover a considerable amount of detail. If there's any way to be a little closer to the mic, Alex, it would help. Okay. I'm not liking our new microphone. Can you hear okay? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, we might go back to the other microphone. It worked better. Okay, so uh, I will go through uh, 15B and attachments. As you can see from that report, and as you are all aware, um, you know, in mid-March, we had our first uh, shelter in place order, which came from the county. It was, it, it was through March 31st initially, and then extended through May 3rd. Uh, and then the governor, Governor Newsom was not too far behind with his shelter in place, which came in March 19th of 2020. His was until further notice. Um, as you know, from the orders, uh, transit is identified as essential infrastructure. And so we are obligated to do the best we can do to try to maintain some level of service for the public so that they can engage their essential travel to, to get to places like the grocery store, office appointment, and those that work at essential infrastructure locations need to get to work. You also know that the governor two orders that gave you relief from the Brown Act and allowed meetings like this to take place without the, the public actually physically in the room, uh, and, and, but they are able to participate through this process that you have today. Um, and that we are really thankful for, but as you know, leading up to last month's meeting, we were still trying to learn as much as we could about what all of that meant, and so we ultimately, in, in conference with the chair, decided to cancel last month's meeting um, now, all of that meant that a lot of things had to take place to react to this uh, 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 pandemic crisis. And if we were going to try to go to the board for all of the items that we normally would, we might have been having board meetings nearly every day, which I think is pretty impossible. So in an effort to protect Metro employees, the writing public and Metro ass assets, uh, I engaged in a number of actions that otherwise would have brought to you in a normal non-COVID environment for approval. And those actions are listed in 15B3, but I'm not going to cover those right with this particular report. I'm going to go to the attachment and cover them within the context of the chronology of events, because I think it's important for you to know what the employees and the management team of this organization have been engaged in um, going all the way back to January, uh, or actually February of this year. <clears throat> As you, so now I'm, I'm on to your attachment 15B. And as you know, um, no, wait, we don't need uh, the slides there. There you go. Uh, those, those slides will come after this part of the report. So on January 20, 2020, <clears throat> the first uh, case of COVID in the United States was confirmed in the state of Washington. On February 3rd, the Metro Safety and Risk Department was tasked with researching corona disinfectants so that we could then uh, nightly disinfecting our buses. That's sort of taking a page out of way back in 2005 when we had the avian flu. At that time, I was at uh, LAMTA and, and we used disinfectant nightly in order to treat our buses. So we brought that same uh, philosophy here. On February 26, we did identify that uh, product that we needed to purchase. Uh, the safety and risk department started working with maintenance and the operations to develop a procedure to disinfect buses and to identify appropriate personal protection equipment or what you hear commonly today as PPE. <clears throat> On March 2nd, uh, we had completed that process. As you can imagine, introducing a new product takes a little time to figure out how to properly apply it, properly dilute it, and protect our employees. 
So on March 2nd, we started disinfecting the inside of the paratransit vehicles. <clears throat> and then on March 3rd, we started disinfecting buses each night, particularly focusing on what we call high touch surfaces, stanchions, seat backs, hand straps, those kinds of things. Then on March 5th, that, in, that uh, turned out to be a very big day for us. Uh, so there were a number of activities that happened there. Um, we started ordering large quantities of hand sanitizers and disinfecting wipes, <clears throat> as you know from uh, no doubt your agencies. Um, sourcing these kinds of things have been very difficult to do. Um, but Greg in our purchasing department has just been a trooper and extremely resourceful and able to get us product that we needed. Um, we started working with Dominican Hospital. They approached us because they needed to set up triage tents in their parking lot. They uh, were displacing a considerable amount of parking, employee parking, and they asked if they could use our SoCal uh, park and ride lot, which is right next door, the one that we've had um, locked up for a considerable amount of time now while we work towards a new paratransit facility there. So by March 24th, we had completed negotiation. Thank you, Julie, for your help on that, that contract. Um, we completed that, got that all signed off, and, and incidentally, we're not charging them for the use of that. We just wanted to facilitate an agreement that made it clear that they have access to it, unlimited access, they have keys to it, and they can use it as needed until, uh, until this COVID crisis is over. Um, so that was, that was a nice partnership that we started on March 5th. Continuing on with March 5th, we started developing our bus interior cards to educate our customers on COVID pre prevention. Our custodial staff started vigorously disinfecting metro facilities every night. Um, we notified bus operators and paratransit drivers that they could wear face masks if they so chose, but um, the CDC at that time was not recommending it. Um, so whenever a, an operator paratransit driver said, I want to wear a face mask, we'd say that that's fine, but why don't you just read the CDC website first um, so that you're aware of what they're recommending. Continue on, um, we started researching what are called disinfecting foggers. Um, we learned from some other transit properties across the nation that that's the one way to disinfect buses at night and do so a little bit more efficiently and quicker. Um, First COVID prevention CDC document was sent to all Metro employees on that date. And then in anticipation of potential future reimbursement, we created, uh, Christina, who's in the room here, created uh, a, an accounting code so that we could capture everything possible that was COVID related in case future funding was reliant on us being very specific about that. Um, we also got con contact from the region nine FTA administrator as uh, surveying us about what we were doing to protect the public and our employees and we responded on that date to that. Uh, and then also on March 5th, um, we started to receive quantities of one ounce refillable bottles. Uh, this is an idea that Ciro had, to get the one ounce refillable hand sanitizer bottles and give them to all bus operators so they can use it throughout the day. And then when they come in or before they go out on their shift the next day, we would have larger containers at the dispatch window for them to refill those bottles. So they, they've been able to have hand sanitizer on their person uh, since March 5th. Um, so that was a lot that occurred on, on March 5th. Uh, and of course, at that time, we didn't know that two days later on March 7th, Santa Cruz would announce its first coronavirus case. <clears throat> then uh, just a day later on, on March 8th, um, we, have, we had an incident with a temp employee at Pacific Station that speculated that she might have been around somebody who might have been around somebody who might have been around somebody who had COVID. <laughs> and so we, out of an abundance of caution, we called the management team in, invoked the uh, emergency operations center that Sunday, talked about what we should do. We had already sent the employees home that worked there uh, and we decided we would continue to keep them home through Monday while we made arrangements for a disinfecting company to come in and completely disinfect uh, Pacific Station from head to toe. And then those employees went back to work on a Tuesday as we had hoped they would be. Um, March 9th, we initiated daily management COVID meetings. So coming out of that uh, weekend activity, we then initiated daily management meetings management meets every day 
Um, initially, it was in this room, and then as things progressed, we went to this exact same Zoom type format. Um, and those meetings uh, typically go up to about two hours every day, um, running through department by department. Um, what do we know? What do we what have, what have we learned? What new things have popped up? What other things can we do for our employees to help protect them? What are the employees asking for? So communicating all kinds of information um, and keeping, again, Greg really busy in ordering things for us to respond to COVID. <clears throat> On March 9th, we also posted to all safety bulletin boards company-wide um, the county agency's interim guidance on social distancing and interim workplace guidance. On the 10th, UCSC announced that in-person classes will end effective March 11th. And then on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Continuing on to the backside of that sheet on March 11th, bilingual COVID prevention card car cards. Those are the uh, cards that you'll see uh, along the sort of the ceiling inside of a bus, on both sides. Those were installed on all buses, <coughs> focusing and the transit centers focusing on COVID prevention. Also on the 11th, the CEO, uh, I authorized additional temp employees to be hired in the way of uh, VSWs, VS vehicle service workers, because the, the workload of keeping a bus clean in its normal non-COVID environment, plus trying to do uh, very vigorous disinfecting of those buses at night required us to bring some additional personnel on. Um, we have since augmented that with four more vehicle service workers that just this week we launched at the four transit centers. And what their job is that each time a bus comes into the transit center, they jump on board with their bucket of disinfectant and rag and they quickly roll through the bus. So the bus uh, each, each night gets disinfected, then it goes out there the next day for a little while. Then as it goes through the transit centers, it gets disinfected by these personnel at the transit centers. And then again, that night, it'll get disinfected again. So we, we've been pretty darn thorough there. <clears throat> On the 12th, Governor Newsom issued the executive order directing that large gatherings of 250 or more be canceled. And of course, we all know how that has evolved into now virtually nobody is in a room together. Or if you are, you're at least six feet of social distancing. On the 12th, the public schools announced closure. At that time, it was going to be from March 16th through the 20th. And of course, we know they've extended that. And then on the 13th, we finally decided uh, what uh, disinfectant augers, uh, well, the disinfectant augers that we did decide on um, did arrive. So now we start into a process of trying to deploy the disinfectant augers, which similar to the deployment of the disinfectant, we needed for our safety and risk department to analyze how to properly fog buses at night and most importantly, how to protect our VSWs with the right PPE. <clears throat> so on the 13th, hand sanitizer dispensers were installed at Pacific Station and Watsonville Transit Center for public use. At that time, we still had the transit center lobbies open. And we started sanitizing our non-revenue vehicles. So we covered the revenue vehicles before this, but now it was time to move on to the non-revenue vehicles. On the 15th, some non-management employees started telecommuting from home five days a week. Also on the 15th, um, I authorized that any employee in the agency uh, over the age of 65 or who self-identifies as at risk um, or having child care problems um, could use their sick leave or their annual leave, however they would like to use it. If they just, if they felt they needed to not come to work, they could use their leaves and we would not charge them with occurrences or progressive discipline or anything else. So we waved off on all of our normal processes for unscheduled absences and just said, hey, if you're not comfortable in coming to work, you know, feel free to use your, your leaves and, and just tell us, you know, what, what, what the issue here is. Um, and so we did have some employees take advantage of that. <clears throat> on the March 16th, the county health agency issued a shelter in place order until midnight, April 7th, 2020. And then on March 16th, we initiated weekly conference calls uh, with the SEIU and SMART leadership. So each week we all get on a, on a conference call jointly. We don't do it separately. And uh, again, receive feedback from the union directly on what things are working well, what things are not working well. 
On the 16th, managers were also provided the opportunity to do some telecommuting a few days a week. And then on the 17th, the remaining non-management employees who could telecommute started telecommuting uh, five days a week. On the 17th, in an effort to reduce the number of hours of potential exposure, para paratransit uh, drivers started on what we call an A, B, and C rotation with the drivers working one day and then having two days off on district pay. So they didn't lose any money and they were all able to reduce the number of hours of potential exposure to the public. <clears throat> the next day on the 18th, we terminated our school term service. So we brought service down just a little bit. And then also on the 18th, the president signed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act effective April 1 through December 31st, 2020, which opened up opportunities for those employees qualifying under that criteria to be able to take up to 12 weeks uh, off. Um, in some cases, uh, depending on which part of the criteria they qualified for, in some cases that would be uh, fully paid. <laughs> On the 19th, Governor Newsom issued his executive order directing residents to shelter in place until further notice. And then on the 23rd, all Metro service changed to the weekend service level seven days a week. <clears throat> this included social distancing to protect the bus operators and the closure of the two transit center lobbies until further notice. Um, we also discontinued the collection of fares until further notice at that point. And that was March 23rd on the 26th in an effort to reduce the number of hours of potential exposures, the bus operators started on their uh, version of the group, which was the A and B group rotation with one group working two weeks and the other group um, on call at home for two weeks with district pay. So we significantly reduced their potential exposure um, and, and that continues uh, to, this, to this date. On the 27th, we put in place a modified Route 4 service because when we <clears throat> went to weekend only service, since Route 4 didn't operate on the weekend, Route 4 uh, terminated service completely. Uh, but we learned that in doing so, we were, we were not servicing a critical infrastructure, which was the county Emmeline complex. So we worked with the county, put back some service so that we could um, continue the essential needs of essential travel to that facility. On the 27th, the president signed the CARES Act, which as we talked about earlier, will provide us around $20 million. And then on the 30th, Metro further notified customers of additional service changes that limited rides uh, to one ride in the, on the same bus in one direction. We were, we were now, because of the free fares, encountering all kinds of problems with joy riders and they would just choose to ride the bus all day. Um, so we needed to say, hey, you know, you get to the end of the line, uh, you cannot reboard that bus. You can stay there and wait for the next bus, but you can't reboard that bus. Um, and we also started to, to make our initial attempts to identify essential travel. On the 31st of March, the county agency issued an extension of the shelter in place order through May 3rd. And then in April, April 2nd, in an effort to further protect all employees, we issued a letter to all employees concerning essential travel and self quarantine requirements that if they're traveling on a plane or a train, if they're traveling outside their county of residence other than to come to work, prior to doing so, they need to have a conversation with the human resources department because the nature of that travel um, may cause us to uh, have them self-quarantine for up to 14 days before we let them come back to work. Um, a rather stringent policy that I put in place, but 100% to protect our own employees. Uh, if if our you know we can only protect our employees the eight hours or so that they're here at work, but there's a lot of other hours they're not here at work that they're responsible for protecting themselves from COVID, and if they're traveling on planes and and going uh, somewhere uh, it, across the United States or even out of country, we want to know we want to assess it, and if we think that uh, they should self quarantine to protect fellow employees, then we will so implement that. Uh, and, and employees since that date have been very good about contacting the HR department. April 6th, we started installing at all Metro facilities, uh, banners, which you'll see in a few moments saying all Santa Cruz Metro dedicated employees are frontline heroes delivering essential services. Um, sort of going to the point that uh, James Sandoval mentioned earlier about the importance of our employees coming to work uh, in the face of a COVID pandemic. 
Um, April 9th, Metro implemented additional service changes to Highway 17 service operating a further reduced schedule. Um, at that point, we were basically carrying 12 people a day over the hill and back, and that just uh, did not warrant the level of service that we had. <laughs> we also put uh, bus capacity uh, limits on the buses, uh, which limited it to five to 12 passengers per bus, depending on the size of the bus that we're operating. And at that point, we were strongly recommending that customers wear their face masks. That's April 9th. April 10th, we received UCSC notification that in-person class, in classes are suspended through the summer session. Uh, and we still don't know uh, with any certainty if they're coming back in the fall, which makes planning service and budgets real challenging. Uh, and then effective today, we uh, actually last night, effective today, we put out um, another notification telling our customers that in order to ride our bus, they must have face coverings per the order issued yesterday and effective midnight tonight um, from the county health uh, officer. So we're enforcing that. And if people do not have a face covering, a face mask, they will not be allowed to ride. We also notified our customers that upcoming Memorial Day on May 25th, we will that we would normally run only one part of our service, and that would be Highway 17. We will not be running Highway 17 on Memorial Day. And then we further reinforce that due to the fact that we're trying our best to in, enforce essential travel, uh, and we are running into some complications where, say, at a terminal, we have more people that want to board than we have capacity under our capacity limited uh, buses. Um, if people have uh, some sort of documentation to show us that they're going to an essential workplace or doctor's appointment, that will help us try to decide who can have priority seating. Um, now, the last part of my presentation has to do with the slides. If we could bring the slides up and we'll just rotate through those. So the first one you'll see is one of the ones that we hit early on, which is uh, uh, notifying our customers of rear door boarding and that we're not requiring fare right now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this was our uh, car cards that we put in our buses. Uh, I, I forget the date, but I mentioned that in the chronology of events. Next slide. Uh, another slide that we copied from several agencies across the nation, um, just uh, adding a tiny bit of levity to the whole discussion, but at the end of the day, if it's not an essential trip, you shouldn't even be at our transit center reading this particular sign. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the weeks uh, in that chronology of events that I went through had to do with reinforcing the message that uh, we can only keep you safe during the hours that you're here at work and you're responsible for yourself those other hours. And just to remind people that, uh, that, that sheltering in place is not a vacation. Um, you need to literally shelter in place, uh, as inconvenient as it can be. Um, and so this particular slide, uh, we actually stole from Mont Monterey Health Agency, gave it to our graphics person and uh, put our logo on it. Actually, we didn't steal it. We got their permission to use it. Next slide, please. So obviously social distancing, this is using the CDC's uh, flyers and slides. Next slide. CDC information, again, commonly seen information. Next slide. Same. Next slide. Same. Next slide. This is uh, the uh, uh, markers that we put at the transit centers in order to help uh, our customers queue up for the bus and to maintain their six feet of uh, social distancing. That's at all our transit centers. Next slide. Elevators, uh, we, we also uh, made note of the fact that our uh, elevators need to be restricted to no more than two people. Next slide. Um, again, reinforcing this popped up everywhere on buses and all of our transit centers, reinforcing the six foot of social distancing, uh, boarding, alighting, and on the bus. Next slide. Customer alert has been revised numerous times, including last night. It uh, maintains the chronology of events because all of the things we have done are still in place and then typically adds to it. So there's another one on our website um, now that has uh, an updated version as of last night. 
And we do get that information out via our Facebook and also our Gov delivery so that customers can be aware to go read this. Next slide. Um, so this is, uh, this is another project that we've been working on. Various transit agencies across the nation have uh, come up with different versions of it, but it's, a, it's a, basically a clear shower curtain. <clears throat> you know, it, it uh, goes to that social distancing, again, to try to protect our bus operators even further because not all of our buses, as a matter of fact, 75% of our buses are incapable of having the rear door actuated by the bus operator, which means still on 75% of our fleet, the customers must board from the front door. And so we wanted to further protect our operators. And these um, have been initially launched about a week, week and a half ago. We were waiting on some additional parts which came in and they'll continue to be installed on buses over the next uh, couple of weeks. So Eddie and team have done a great job with coming up with this concept. Uh, what happens is when the bus operator pulls up to the stop, they close the curtain while people are boarding. And then after the customers have boarded and they're ready to embark on their journey, the, the uh, bus operator then opens this clear curtain and continues on safely. Um, I did want to note too, that we added additional money to our security contract to uh, have additional security officers help us with the essential travel enforcement uh, and and also uh, in enforcing that uh, customers can only bring on a bus what they can carry on their lap. That has been a bit challenging for us. And uh, so we had to expand our security in order to do some of that too. Next slide. <clears throat> so this was added uh, about a week ago to our website. We, we now have a tab. If you go to the homepage on our website, there's a tab labeled coronavirus. If you click on that, there are a number of resource materials there, including a, a letter which we will update periodically, just helping the customers understand what we are doing as an agency to help keep them and our uh, employees safe. Next slide. Next slide. That was page two. Um, capacity, all buses now are marked. Um, now keep in mind, we went through every series of bus, we measured what it, what we would have to do in order to uh, capacity limit those and create six feet of social distancing and each bus was rated. So each bus has a sign like this. Next slide. <clears throat> we also purchased uh, a number of uh, advertising uh, uh, advertisements to put on our advertising slots on our buses. Um, we purchased this and they have been installed on our buses. Next slide. This goes hand in hand with the slide two slides ago. This is what it looks like inside a bus today. Uh, so our safety and risk director Rufus has worked with Eddie and team and they've uh, measured and uh, cordoned off seats for uh, customers to sit in and not sit in so that we can create that six foot of social distancing. Next slide. And that this is just a Facebook post that was recently put up and we continue to update Facebook and Twitter um, on a pretty regular basis as time permits. Next slide. And of course, uh, all Santa Cruz Metro dedicated employees are frontline heroes delivering essential services. Uh, we purchased these banners. Uh, thank you, Angela, for your hard work on that. She was able to do that rather quickly. And these were installed at all Metro facilities. I believe it was five. Five of these were posted, one at each Metro facility. Chair, that concludes item 15B. Would you like me to pause and answer any questions before we go on to C? Yes, are there questions from board members first? Trina. Not you're, hearing still, you. you're still muted, Trina. Yes. Well. Now we hear you. Okay, keeps getting popped. You mentioned that you needed to hire extra security because uh, people boarding the bus are bringing more than just a laptop or something that they can just carry on their person. How is that working? I mean, it, do you have security with a driver or how is that working in terms of um, limiting what um, the passengers are bringing with using security? Yep, good question. So the bus operators have been empowered to 
to address that issue. And if someone, so let's say they're not at a terminal, they're not at a transit center, they're out on the line somewhere and they encounter that. Um, if the bus driver uh, asks somebody to not board a bus because they have too many things and they do not comply, that bus operator will radio dispatch and then dispatch may send a supervisor there. They may send our, our mobile uh, security guard there to help address the situation. And if it's bad enough, we might just call the police to go address the situation. Within the terminals and the transit centers, the security guards are stationed there at Watsonville and at Pacific Station. Um, they are doing a great job of enforcing that. Um, we've had some brushes with uh, some members of the public who have been very argumentative and insistent about that, and we're holding fast on it. If they cannot carry it in their lap, we will not let them board the bus. And they're still able to take a bike because the bike is loaded on the back, on the outside of the bus. So that's not a limit for anybody that's using a bike on top of the bus, right? That, that is correct. Thank you. And then I think uh, John Leopold. And then uh, John. Well, I, I appreciate the, the all the work that uh, that's been done to help uh, protect uh, our employees. Um, I really appreciate the, the willingness of, uh, of Alex, uh, the staff, uh, uh, to work with the, the constituent union leaders. It, you know, what the, the first couple of days of this were, it was hard to figure out what was the right thing to do. We, uh, I know I had a lot of conversations with Alex. I thought he did a good job in trying to balance a lot of interests um, and, and deal with the situation that quickly uh, evolved. And I appreciate all the efforts and the continued efforts that have uh, have gone on. I just had one uh, question. Um, the uh, with the social distancing requirements in the buses, um, are there many instances where we're leaving anybody behind? There, there are a number of instances where we are doing that. Yes. And yeah. And, and so when that when when that's if it, if that's not the transit center, what happens when that you know, when that goes on? Right. So the operator will pass by a stop if if that operator is at capacity, and there's somebody waiting at a stop. The operator will pass by that stop. Um, one of the things that I posted in the last uh, week or two, um, both Facebook and on our uh, website was just an explanation of that for the customers and just asking them to, to not be upset when we have to pass them by. Unfortunately, it just means that the bus is full. The operator is not doing it because they're just being mean to the person. They're at, they're at capacity. And, and I'm just asking the customers not to be upset at our bus mm -hmm. operators. Some folks have suggested that we should pull up to the stop and inform them that we're full. We're not asking the operators to do that because it, I think it's fraught with problems, including some of our troublesome um, folks uh, that will, once you open that door, they'll just dive right onto that bus. Right. And, and, but is it, is it, is it a couple people a day? Is it a couple people a week? I mean, what, what's, what does the pass by look like? Well, keep in mind, ridership is down between 95 and 97%. Oh, yeah, sure. Overall ridership in general is, is not that high, but yes, I, I think I would just characterize it as several times a day. Yeah, I just think that these are people, uh, hopefully, who are going to essential work, and you know, to, to the extent that uh, that they're doing essential travel, it's 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 a hard to see that bus go by, especially on a weekend schedule where the bus won't come by again for another hour at least. Yeah, and John, some of our, I'm just going to say, joy riders, ones people that just want to ride the bus all day now that it's free, um, have become pretty clever. I mean, they they say, oh yeah, I'm going to an essential job, or I'm going to a pharmacy. What about a doctor's appointment? Right? They're invoking the things, which is why we went to the next level of saying, you know, hey, hey, folks, you can help us out if you can if you can produce something that shows that you're going to your job uh, or a doctor's appointment, show us your cell phone, something like that. We'll give you priority seating. So we're, we're trying our best without being discriminatory. Yeah, um, it is a challenge because the free fare does bring, unfortunately, um, some interesting characters onto the bus. Yeah, no, I, and you and I have talked about this. I, I appreciate all the efforts and, and just the, uh, I've also heard from uh, drivers uh, about the concern. Uh, I think, you know, this is going to be a constantly evolving uh, policy uh, whenever we start uh, changing the shelter in place order and more and more people are, 
are out, um, it's going to it's going to challenge us to figure out how to best meet the needs of the of the transit public. And John, I want to double back to your first statement. Um, it, I, I, I didn't give enough kudos in in the uh, chronology I just gave. You know, I, I want to give a lot of kudos and credit to the SEIU for working with us through this to figure out how we can um, put people on alternate work schedules, do telecommuting, still get productivity and manage the critical business forward, pay our bills. Um, they've done a fantastic job. And I want to give kudos to James. Um, you know, when we first put the A and B together, um, he brought everybody together and literally like in one weekend um, got this new bid out he did something extremely unusual where each person had five minutes to bid. I mean, that's really unusual. Five minutes to bid, boom, done, move on to the next. Um, got that done so that we could put what's currently in place. And he's working with Anna Marie and the ops team on the next interim bid, which will go into effect this next Thursday that further helps us to, to save a few dollars. So kudos to both the unions for an outstanding job. Here, here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Myers followed by Alta Northcutt. Donna. Thanks, Mike. Um, I just had a couple of questions, uh, a little bit following up on John's questions. Uh, he, he asked my main questions regarding to leaving, leaving passengers um, and just looking um, forward as we change some of um, how we may approach this, Alex. Um, I'm just curious, um, I know you have to be responding to, you know, these different um, directives coming from state and federal government. Uh, I'm just curious, um, how do you, how are you going to handle that kind of planning work? Um, and how do we, is, are you finding that our social media is the best outlet to get information out? Um, is there any other methods that we're using so that people understand these new these new aspects to write, you know, to potential writing uh, and getting getting where they need to during this during this period. So I'm just curious, um, especially if we are leasing, leaving people, um, how do we keep folks up to date as much as possible so that they're successful in getting to their jobs if if you know they are needed or their appointments? And just a little, if you could just comment a little bit, not only on the present but a little bit on your ideas in the future. And then um, I just also just want to thank you, um, your staff, the management team, um, and all uh, our drivers and everyone. Um, obviously, this has been just something that I've, none of us have ever experienced before, and I'm I'm very impressed by all the work across all the, all um, aspects of the metro in terms of um, the attention that you're providing to try to keep um, our our staff safe, but also. Um, have our buses be safe for people to travel in. And so I just want to extend my thanks and appreciation to everyone's work. And if you could just comment a little bit, Mike, uh, excuse me, not Mike, I'm looking at Mike. So um, if you could comment uh, just a little bit, Alex, on how you're forecasting these changes and what you're finding to be the best way to communicate to our riders. Right. Passengers. Probably what we've been doing is, is uh, also going to be the path forward. You know, not everybody is on Facebook, right? And that's right. A, a super small percentage of our population, but it's a tool. Not everybody's on Twitter, but it's a tool. <clears throat> and what we can do is even though, for example, Twitter is character limited, we can get a simple message out and say, hey, click on this link or go to our website where you can find many more resources on this topic. Um, so we're trying to drive everybody to the website to the greatest extent possible. <clears throat> we're also trying to drive everybody to Gov Delivery. And we've been on that mission for as long as I've been here and probably predating me, trying to get our customers to just take that simple action of going online and signing up for Gov Delivery because that's that's our best way to get information in their hand um, really quickly. Okay. In addition to that, Ciro has developed a really nice um, uh, bilingual flyer uh, that he's updated, I think, at least three or four times in the last several weeks. As things evolve, he goes in and updates that and then um, he delivers it to the security guards and also we place those on all the buses. <clears throat> so anybody riding a bus, anybody going to a transit center can read this in English or Spanish and understand what's going on. Even, even that simple point uh, about why we're passing you up at the, uh, at the bus stop because we're capacity limited. And, and so when he makes the next generation of that, he delivers them 
and he pulls back the old generation so there's no confusion and 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 that's that's probably and then the security guards are also helping us at the transit centers getting those out too okay so great i i really appreciate that we're we're making that bilingual effort to to reach all to reach everyone and um, that, that was one of my questions um follow up was just are we able to reach? Are we able to reach um, our passengers and our users in a way that you know helps them understand all the various changes as well? So it sounds like we're on that. Um, the only thing I would offer potentially is um, the cities had had very good luck with a number of PSAs that we've published on social media. Um, we've done those in Spanish and English, um, and just bringing different aspects. Very short PSAs around specific topics. Uh, we publish those on our Facebook page. They seem to get picked up, and we've been getting millions of users off of those. So maybe something in the future. We, those are literally just filmed, um, sometimes just with a cell phone, and and put up on up on our uh, Facebook page. So uh, we have had good luck with that with that kind of outreach as well. So thank you for all your work. Thank Thanks, Don. I'm sure you're speaking for all of us. Before I call it an Alta, if you look in your upper right hand corner of your screen, you see you have a choice of choosing a gallery view. So you don't have to just look at my face. You'll see like you're more in a meeting. You'll see all of our little faces. So I recommend that as a way of not looking at my face all through the <laughs> So next to Alta, go ahead. And then after that, Aurelio. I too want to thank you, Alex, for all the good work. And I want to thank um, all of our drivers because they've been very, very um, professional, courteous, and then just authentic in their workload. Um, and I know this is stressful times for a lot of people. Um, concerning the communications that you've been giving us, I want to thank you for that because it has allowed us to communicate out to our students in a weekly time frame. So when you give us information, we can make different decisions and judgment calls for the operations at Cabrillo. So that's been very, very helpful. I want to thank you for that. And um, because a lot of our students don't necessarily have social media access, they use Cabrillo for a lot. We're learning that Cabrillo was almost a hub for a lot of resources. And because we're closed down, that means the impact is greater. So um, we've we've been able to communicate using the email for our students who don't necessarily have social media. So um, it's because of your updates that we're able to get ahead of those messages for our students. And I also wanted to, um, we have been working on using the CARES Fund to cover our summer contracts because we're gonna be online exclusively for the summer as well. And because the Metro is still providing the service to students, we can justify that money going to cover that contract. And so that's been a very big help for us to be able to keep our community relationships ahead of the game and our students served. We have had students who have had to use the um, bus and they weren't sure if coming to Cabrillo to pick up equipment and things like that were essential because we were doing loaner mm -hmm. programs for technology. Um, and so our bus drivers were able to communicate that yes, they can ride to Cabrillo. We've only had two students who have been passed up that have reported being passed up, but we were able to say this is the reason why, and they were totally understanding and knew the weekend bus schedule, so they were able to get back out there and wait for the next bus. So it's been very, very helpful, and I'm hoping that you know, um, in times where we're less stressed, that we continue these kind of humane efforts. And I just want to thank you all for your work with the employees as well as the community, because I think that's one of the biggest lessons we're learning is that we all matter. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Really. Yeah, again, reiterate everything right there. I'd uh, like to thank the, the unions, the staff, and everybody that's involved. This uh, pandemic has really put us into a, a, a whirlwind. And I, I, but I think the Metro is handling it well, and I think everybody in the staff is handling it well. I have three questions. Um, two, two are concerns. Uh, the first concern is if we have a family that boards the bus and, it's, uh, and they're small children, um, are they required to be separated from their mother and take uh, their own seats? You know, I I don't I haven't thought through that question. Sarah's online. I'm going to ask Sarah if he's because I I, saw, I noticed the picture on the bus that you know we only had we had the four seats separated. Nobody could sit. And good question. Yeah, Sarah, can you unmute or do I need to unmute you? And, and then another question for concern me while he gets hooked up there is uh, if there's an individual that has food that's been given to them to carry on, and it's two bags and they can't carry it on their lap. Are they not allowed to get on the bus? Technically, no, but the operator has discretion on addressing that issue. 
And I know for a fact, a lot of people who have used the bus have been able to get on with um, a limited amount of groceries. I yeah. think I think you need to get a sense of the scale of the problem we were facing. People are basically getting on the bus with a shopping cart worth of stuff, way too much to get on the bus with. And yeah, yeah, no, that that part I understand. But my, my concern is that we're being too rigorous. We, we need to be careful. Apparently, the bus, that. bus drivers have some discretion here. I think they're being reasonable about having to yeah. enforce them. Really That's what I feel. We're we're trying to get Zero's audio up and running. For some yeah, we're waiting on that. And then when Zero's getting hooked up, my my last question is. I know we we started our app for uh, the bus route timing to know that our bus is going to arrive at this bus stop at this time. Is is there any way any part of that application that can be said this bus is not full and is going to go by these bus bus stops? Yeah, so uh, we don't have that app up and running. We when COVID hit, we were still aggressively uh, working through the challenges of implementing that AVL system on, on a fleet of varying age buses. And then COVID hit and that has slowed things down if not stopped it completely until this, this is over. So we don't have that tool, the AVL tool. Um, you know, we looked at trying to place the bus out of service um, when that occurs, but that had all kinds of technology problems too. So. Um, we just could not come up with a way to notify a customer standing at a stop why we're passing them by, which is why I embarked on this campaign of using the various media sources to try to educate people about that topic. So, so then the AVL uh, app is not up and running? Is, no, right. we're not up and running yet. No. no. Um, Zero, Zero, are you on yet? Zero's on now. Zero, the question was, if you didn't hear it, uh, what if it's a, a mother and two children? Uh, how are we handling that uh, under capacity limitations? Zero, are you on? I'm not sure he is. Are the children required to see it sit separately? I don't think Zero is actually on. Yeah, some he's he's on. Oh, Brandon Freeman to all. Writes, we will not separate a mother from. I assume it's going to say her children. It does. Okay. Or, or father. Or father. Or a parent or guard, guardian. Yeah, that has to be a mother. That's <laughs> traditional, I suppose, but not necessary. All right. Thank you, Brandon. And did you get your other question answered, Aurelio? Yes. If people look in the chat, they can see the whole yeah. uh, statement from Brandon. Okay, anyone else uh, with a question? Cynthia Matthews. Yeah, comment. I want to reinforce Donna's suggestion for using the little video PSA clips. We're using those a lot with the city and if Metro would do one and just share it with all your, the city, the county, the schools, the social service agencies, they can all put that up. The, the, um, uh, entities that might be um, speaking to the riders of the buses. So um, I just, it's it's pretty easy to do. I just uh, want to reiterate that. Um, also, just an observation, the term joyriding, I understand 100% what you mean by that, but that could be really found offensive if it gets out there in public. So I don't have a substitute for that, but I just, I just pointed out. Um, and the response from everyone has been so spectacular <laughs> over such a profound situation in such a short period of time. It's really, it's very impressive. So those are just a couple of suggestions. Thank you. Uh, I see Sarah still trying to get on. Are there any other questions or comments? I don't I, see any right I, now. I will add. I think in the public health officer's directives, I don't have it in front of me, that there is something that the social distance doesn't have to be maintained between members of the same family. That's correct. You're correct about that. Yeah. Yeah, right. that's, that's, that's correct. So that's right. the common sense application. I think the issue was when the bus has been all taped off and as a practical matter, how are they going to let the kids sit? I mean, if they're small kids, they could slip under their yellow tape or something. But I even even when they're, I, I remember that image. The tape is over the blocks, uh, uh, row of block seats, but then there's a sign on one seat and one seat is open. So okay. 
So at least mother, some of the father and kid could sit there. Yeah. Okay, so Alex has taken a whole bunch of actions here, or the, the, the management staff have taken a number of actions, and the unions as well working on that. But those normally would have come to us before they, if we were not in a crisis, they would have come to us as sort of policy issues to open up a new way of doing something. That's not possible. We're being asked basically to ratify those decisions after the fact, as we make it our best attempt at least to have a clear public process and be transparent about how these things are all taking place. So I'm looking for a motion to basically support or authorize the actions that have been taken under this emergency kind of condition. So this, do I have such a This motion? is John Leopold, I'll make that motion. Second. John, you're seconding Cynthia's motion. We have a motion. And this is for, for 15B, ANSI, both of them? No, it's 15B only. Yeah. Just B we're doing, we haven't heard okay. it in full detail. So are there any members of the public, given that that motion's now on the floor, are there any members of the public or the unions for that matter who would like to comment on our authorizing these decisions after the fact, those of course could be reversed or changed if, the, if we feel that somehow they were inappropriate or whatever. I, I don't feel that at all, but I wanna make sure that option's open for the board. Any concerns, issues? Any member of the public wanna comment on that? I'll ask Gina to look over our list of public. Okay. Yep, I don't see anything. Okay, Dan, did you have a comment? No. Hey. no. When you rustle a paper or something, all of a sudden you get highlighted like you're ready to speak. I'll just nod my head. So, do we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, and Mike, uh, yes. do you have another comment, Cynthia? Yeah. Would it be appropriate to say that we understand that this is a fluid situation and other directions may be needed? <laughs> that I, I'll take that as a, if that's a, that you're the maker of the motion, that yeah. could be friendly if it's agreed to by, I think, uh, was. John Leopold is our second on that motion. And I see that Bonnie Moore would like to make some kind of comment perhaps before we vote. So we'll wait a moment. Bonnie, she's typing this out. I'm not going to open my chat and see. Um, the I, comment of Bonnie's that I see is entirely appropriate. Okay. That's great. So in that case, uh, we'll have the roll call then, please, for this motion. So Director Matthews, your friendly amendment is you understand the fluidity of the situation? And that um, additional actions may be necessary in the period between now and our upcoming board meeting. Thank you. And we, we acknowledge that these actions are temporary in order to address a serious situation. Thank you. Okay, I have a motion from Director Leopold, a second from Matthews, and the roll call. All the way around, actually. Motion by Matthews, second by Leopold. Oh, sorry. Got it. Not that it matters, but <laughs> let's get it right. It does. Okay. Director Baltorf? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Did I hear an aye? Aye. Thank you. Director Rothwell? Aye. Dr. Rotkin? Aye. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll now move on to our next item. That is item 15C, it's a request for board authorization for the CEO to act as the authorized agent for receiving state and or federal emergency assistance funds. One could say that's just a no brainer. We should just have a motion in second, but we'll go briefly about it first. <laughs> I would agree with that comment. Oh, sorry. Chair, director, I would agree with that comment. Uh, um, you, you periodically authorize me to be your agent, um, and this is a similar type of a situation. We're looking at the uh, FEMA program, for example, um, what we may be able to charge some of our expenses to. Um, we're not 100% you know, if we're going to do that or how we would do that. We want to be very careful in using that program. Um, but should we go down that route, you would, you would authorize me to 
um, submitted application for reimbursement. Okay. Um, are they, did you want to have uh, Wanda Moo make any additional comments there? Wanda Moo, anything you want to add, Joe? No? You want to show you? We'll let you look at Wanda Moo. How about that? <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chairperson. Good morning. Okay. Better. <laughs> good morning, uh, Chairperson, board members, staff, and guests. Uh, as Alex already explained, we have been uh, spending a lot of money on uh, our COVID-19 uh, related response. So, uh, so most of some of this expense might be uh, eligible for FEMA reimbursement. And so this authorization would give us uh, some kind of uh, revenue so that we can at least get some funding for uh, our response to uh, uh, this COVID-19 uh, response. So. I would like to ask the board to designate uh, Alex as an authorized uh, agent to receive the state and federal money as required by the California Office of Emergency Service. Thanks so much. Anna. Thank you, Wanda. Let me ask uh, any board members have any comments on this matter? I see none. John definitely does not have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Are there members of the public who'd like to comment on this authorization? Apparently not. I welcome a motion to- I uh, would move the recommended uh, actions. Motion I'll by second. John, second by Donna Myers. Or we get a really on next to the next motion. Any, <laughs> any other comments, questions? Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please? Aye. 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 Aye.
I just don't know what it's going to be right now. Um, we're having discussions about a deficit bu budget come June. Um, not so sure we can do that because of some outside things like uh, having a balanced budget for our TDA claim, but we're doing some research. I know the whole time I've been here, we've never had a budget that wasn't balanced in some way, but uh, we're, we're doing some research to see if, if that's something that can be put forward. We do want the public to know what, um, what our situation is to the best of our knowledge, uh, but we also need to follow um, the rules to put the budget forward. Thanks. Um, just before I go any further, let, let me thank uh, Ian Berry, that's B-E-R-R-Y, from Community Television, who's doing a lot of the technical stuff behind the scenes here for our being able to have this meeting this morning. Um, I think it's kind of a key role, and I think we should recognize his, his help, because without it, I think we wouldn't be online as uh, effectively as we have been. Um, we've now heard the report on where we're at in terms of this uh, proposed budget. Are there any comments from board members about this proposal? Cynthia Matthews. Yeah, um, I'm totally supportive. I would like to add, when it comes to time for motion, that we add language to the effect, we um, adopt the attached budgets, et cetera, understanding that this budget will be subject to substantial review and revision due to the anticipated but unpredictable effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just, just to put it out there. Add a motion? Fair enough. I'll make it a motion. Yeah. I'll make second that. Motion. By Cynthia, I'll second that motion, but any further comments from board members? Any members of the public want to comment on this proposed budget, which again is a placeholding budget? Then can we have a roll call vote, please, on the motion that's on the floor, made by Cynthia, seconded by me? Okay. Sorry. Uh, that's right. Motion by Matthews, second by Rotkin. Roll call. Director Baltor? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Director Lind? Aye. Director Matthews? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Myers? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Rothwell? Aye. Director Ratcliffe. Aye. The motion is unanimous. Thank you. I don't be coming back in May. Normally, our budget, there probably won't be too much change to it. Um, but just that's our normal process that we go through is that in May, we would normally come back to you with our budget. This one should have been adopted in March, but because we didn't have a meeting, we moved it to April. And then we'll go forward from there to June. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. We're next on to item number 17. This is an update on Pacific Station by Alex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I should point out that uh, Ciro is now in the room here. If you still would like to hear from him, he he abandoned his technical difficulties over at JKS and ran, ran back here. Um, would you like to hear from him or? or? Sure, if you'd like to add any comments. Uh, Ciro, the, the issue that people raised was uh, how we're gonna handle a situation where say a family gets on the bus together um, they're not required to socially distance and it would allow, you know, more people on the bus if the three or two or three or four people could sit together in those seats and uh, not have to be six feet apart from each other. And basically one family would take the whole bus sometimes. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, basically, I mean, we're not going to leave anybody that has those kind of dependencies out there. I mean, there's going to be some provisions made. Uh, the Basically, it's left the operator's discretion. I mean, clearly... Our training, uh, their training has led that our purpose is to transport people. And you're not gonna leave a mother with some children uh, laying by the wayside because they can't fit on the bus due to our capacity limitations. I mean, there's a way of social distancing in a, in a manner. I mean, the family together really uh, already have that established. So they can sit within two seats, maybe one person on the lap, maybe across from each other. It, it's, it's workable is what I'm trying to say. So um, the, the social distancing that we've established is because we've a free ride has uh, created a situation in which a lot of people are wanting to use the bus as kind of a, a rolling shelter in a way. And as a result, they carry a lot of items, they carry a lot of things with them, um, and they're, they're just going back and forth. Same bus. Our, our rule is you can't take the same bus 
unless it's a different route. So that bus may arrive at the transit center, uh, they'll alight, the curtain changes, maybe it was a 71, now it changes to a 69W, they're allowed back on the bus to go back a different route. But if it's the same bus with the same curtain, 71, returning back, they're not allowed to go back on that same bus if it's the same person that got off. Security is monitoring that, as is the operator. The operator will uh, seek assistance if necessary from security when that uh, those types of situations arise. It's been working out for the most part. At each point where an operator passes someone by because they're full, they do radio it into dispatch. The dispatch is aware uh, of the situation. And basically it's just a, a matter of waiting for the next bus to, to assume the route. Our mobile units, uh, patrol units from the first alarm are assisting greatly in uh, ensuring that people are not taking advantage while they're on route, not at the transit centers, but on route. So they're responding to calls from the uh, operators and such when necessary. Thanks for that further clarification. We appreciate it. Sure. So now we're at item number 17. This is uh, Alex is going to talk to us about the uh, civic station update. I had a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. There you go. <laughs> I just wondered if you had any incidences of where you passed up somebody because it was full and then they waited for an hour and then you passed them up again because it was full. I have not had any reports of that as of yet. Um, okay. It may be happening, but I'm not aware of it. It could happen. Okay. I think because dispatch knows of the situation, at least we have some communication about that, perhaps if, if that were to occur. Yeah. Uh, not guaranteed, but we're our best. To the best, to the best of our knowledge, yes. I mean, that. Does that answer your question, Dan? Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, item 17, Alex. an oral update on Pacific Station. What's going on? Yeah, just quickly on this, I just want you to know that uh, over the last month and a half, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb from the city and I have continued to work on the MOU. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, I think it was late last week, um, we worked through our final issues and came to the meeting of the minds. Um, so, I guess the only caveat I have on this is when I've been working on modifications to the MOU, I work directly with our council, Julie, and her, her sub-council um, to make sure that we flesh it through the council. Um, unfortunately, Bonnie hasn't done the same thing. So what she's got to do now is take what we've negotiated and go to the city attorney. Um, so the, the, the asterisk is this. I mean, that city attorney could come back with further changes now that I wish we would have talked about through the process. And uh, now we've got to engage in more negotiation. If he, he or she doesn't come back with anything substantial, which is what my hope is, uh, then what we've negotiated should just come back to you for agreement at your next board meeting in May. So that's where we're at with that. Thanks. We're, I think everybody appreciates that progress on this issue because it's we've been trying to move forward for quite a while on it. And glad that we're making some progress there. Any other comments from board members about that report? Any members of the public want to comment on that? Okay, that's an oral report. Does not require any board action. Our final uh, open board uh, item is to uh, uh, Julie Sherman, our council, tell us what's going to go on in closed session and offer the public an opportunity to comment on whatever items are coming before us. Julie? My mute off. Okay, everybody can hear me? Yes. Um, okay, so there are two items listed. It's a, a performance evaluation for the CEO. And the second item, I have just received word from Metro's workers' compensation attorney, Marie Sang. That item is not ready to go, so that item is going to be pulled. Okay. So we'll just be having the one item. And there will not be a report out. There will not be any board action after the closed session. Thank you very much for that. Let me, uh, before we uh, close down this public session, since we won't be coming back to it, let me ask that the staff give a clear instruction to all board members how they get onto the closed session 
item. This won't be open to the public. In fact, many of our uh, staff are not welcome. At this point, we, we've heard from uh, Alex earlier. Alex, would you like an opportunity to address the closed session before we send you out of the room? Um, no, just to add one other uh, layer to what you said, I think our ex officios are not allowed to participate in that too, I believe. That's correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. So, what, for their, their my understanding is that all, each of you, each of the board members, the uh, non uh, people who are regular board members, have uh, an email that tells them uh, you can go click on a, on a uh, URL that basically will take you to the closed session. Uh, do I understand that properly? Is that correct? Uh, I, I want to make sure I can find it. <laughs> yeah. So right now, yeah. if you move your screen Same to the thing. side it'll, and get back to your email, you should find an email address, uh, I mean, an email item. It comes from Ian. Becca Reed, I believe, sent this out. Who? I got one from I got one from Ian Barry. He's from um, Community TV, Mike. I think he might. That was yeah. the most recent one we got was from Ian Barry. Becca, Becca got us into here, but I think Ian Barry gets us into the closed session. Yeah, we would we would have gotten it this morning. Yeah, yeah. I don't see that on mine. Is it, is it any different than the one we were sent earlier by? Uh... Here, what what I'm going to do, if if you don't mind, is we'll go ahead and end this session. Those board members, Julie and Alex, that can and think they have a link to go into the closed session. If we don't see a board member there, then I will ask Ian to send you a new invite. How's that sound? That sounds like a problem. So okay. we're, we're, we're going this slow. It might take people a while to get online. So I'm going to get get on back online as quickly as you can. But it may we may be up to five or six, maybe even ten minutes if necessary. Get everybody back on. Make sure we're ready to go in a closed session. Okay. Um, Mike, Mike, yes, I just want you to know that I, I said earlier that I have a phone call at eleven o'clock, and uh, if it's done quickly, I will get back to the uh, closed session. Thank you. And then, Mike, if you will announce. Yes. To Meeting and then adjourn this meeting. Is that correct, Julie? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I said if you will announce the next meeting in May. Yes, thank you. And then, Julie, we can adjourn this meeting and not come back. Is that correct? No, no. We have to recess into okay. closed session. We have to come back at least, you know, Mike and me, so I can do my report out, and then we adjourn. So, okay. you got the board members are going to go to your closed session. And then you're going to come back in here, but I'm going to ask Alex to let me know when you're ready to come back into the public session so that I can come and record that portion. Right, but just for the public, okay. you know, mem members of the board and the public know, we don't expect any substance in that. It's just going to report out there's nothing to report, but that's a re legal requirement of the Brown Act. So basically, once we finish the closed session, there'll be no need for, unless something extraordinary happens in closed session, there'll be no need to come out and... Uh, and report back. That's not our plan. Anything that comes out of the closed session that requires action will be going on to our next board meeting. Okay. So you all are going to go out of here and try to get in the closed session. And if you don't, we'll be right. Okay. All right. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to log off here as, as are the rest yeah. of you. Okay. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>